Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. I'm Norman Cook, also known as Fatboy Slim, and you're listening to House Culture Podcast. House Culture. Hi everyone and welcome to season two of the House Culture podcast, hosted by me, the managing editor at House Culture, Matt Rouse. We are back people, have you missed us? I know a lot of you have been asking where we've been the past few months and the answer is pulling together a plethora of icons from the world of house music all for your listening pleasure. If you thought season one was good, just wait until you hear who we've got in store across these upcoming episodes. You will not be disappointed. And if you've only just discovered house culture and want to know what we're all about, as I always say, we are a collective of house music fans who have come together through our mutual love of the beat to celebrate the spirit of house music. Come follow us on Instagram at housecultureNet, where you'll get a daily dose of all things related to this scene we know and love. Also, if this is your first time listening to the podcast, welcome aboard. And don't forget to dig through our back catalogue of episodes where you'll find interviews with the likes of Greg Wilson, John Trencher, Terry Farley, Danny Clockwork and many more. Are you ready to kick off season two? Let's go! In this episode, I'm so proud to say that we chat to Fatboy Slim, Mr. Norman Cook. This mighty dubcat has not only had a hand in some of the most iconic dance music tracks from the past 30 years, he's also recently sold out arenas with his huge stage show and he still loves to keep it real by jumping behind the decks at clubs of any size all over the world. As you're here, we caught up with Norm just as the coronavirus crisis was ramping up but we did get a chance to uncover the story behind his first dance floor epiphany. In that moment I got the soulfulness of the music and I got the feeling of togetherness that you would get in those days at a club and that collective euphoria just pissed all over me being a kind of hip-hop purist. Understand how a dance floor can really influence its own behaviour behind the decks? The really joyful bit is when it actually becomes a conversation of I'll do something and that will give them so much joy that they start doing something that gives me tons of joy and you just get this vicious circle of like how, you know, how stupid can we get or how deranged can we get or how sexy can we get. And learn the reason why he was born to become a DJ. Me, when I hear a tune I like, I can only enjoy it by sharing it with other people. For some reason, that's the way I get my kicks out of music. Those kind of people, that's why we become the DJs. (laughs) So, let's praise this legend like we should. This is Norman Cook. House Culture. Right, I'm sat here in a beachfront property in Brighton, which can only mean one thing, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, but sat opposite me right now is none other than Fatboy Slim himself, Mr Norman Cook. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for inviting us into your home That's to all chat. Right. Thanks, thanks for coming. Thanks for caring. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, you're an absolute megastar who's played a part amongst many music scenes. Uh, but for the purpose of this chat, we want to investigate the dance music part of your career. Uh, can you tell us how did you first discover house music and repetitive beats? Oh, it's a, lo- it's a long story. I could, <laughs> what, you see, I could waffle on for hours. I've been DJing for years... Uh, First of all, just playing sort of new wave and punk records when I was 15. And then there was this whole kind of electronic, alternative electronic scene when I moved down to Brighton um, in the very early 80s. And it was kind of early hip hop records, and but mixed with like The Clash and Susie and the Banshees. And, and then that sort of morphed into the sort of new romantic-y stuff and sort of electro, the, the early kind of electro stuff like Human League and... Yeah, it was it was kind of a little bit of everything. There was nothing sort of unifying it. And then the rare groove, I was quite big on rare groove. So I was that kind of DJ. I was came more from the side of blacker, funkier side of it. Yeah. But in 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 the midst of that there was these tunes coming out of America. Um I remember this brutal house by Nitro Deluxe and things like that, and these sort of weird tunes that were kind of like electro records, but kind of had this kind of four four disco feel feel to them. And I, I must confess, I wasn't actually that knocked out by them. I thought they ca- sounded a bit... Uh, they didn't work funky enough for me. I kind of yeah. liked stuff slower and more, more black, basically. And um, then, at uh, this time, I, got a, I, got, I ran off and joined the circus. I moved up to Hull and joined a band called The House Martins, which is a very white pop 
indie pop band. Yeah. And which I kind of felt was more my my destiny growing up in, you know, white suburbia. Uh, you know, I didn't feel like I could, you know, I'd be playing these records by, made by people, you know, out of the projects in <laughs> New York. And, and it kind of felt a little bit of sort of white middle class guilt that I wasn't, you know, that wasn't really me. So the house Martins and it was mates, you know, Paul was a mate of mine from school. So yeah. went off and did that. And that was like 85 to 88. And 88 in Hull, where I lived, there wasn't much going on really in the sort of club <laughs> scene. And I was sort of traveling a lot with the band. So, but then when I moved back to Brighton in 88, something very, very strange had happened to all my friends. They were all wearing bandanas and going, I see you, <laughs> and telling me to get right on one, matey. And, um, and I, was, I was quite bemused at first. The first summer I was back, I just thought, and then... That was the, the, the summer of kind of, of uh, you know, we call it Acid and yeah. the, all these house records. And I just thought, I, just, I didn't really get it at first. And I, I really liked my, my rap music and my funk music. So I kind of stayed DJing. I went back to DJing, like, you know, what, I, what I, I kind of felt best. And there was, there was the odd record that really turned me on. But as a whole, I just thought, and also it was kind of, you know, when everything, anything's at its peak yeah. of like, you know, the sun are banging on it. One minute they're saying, Ban these evil acid house barons, and then they're selling you smiley t-shirts, and it all, it's all a bit kind of you know yeah. contrived. And so I didn't really. But then one night, some friends of mine uh, took me to Boys Own did a do at uh, Butlins in Bognor, just up the road from us, and it was a weekender, and all my mates were going, so I thought I'd go. And I I had an epiphany, an epiphany which later found out Darren Emerson was responsible for, oh, wow. but I didn't know at the time. But all I knew was that I. I had a cheeky pill and I was enjoying myself and just just at the moment when I was sort of feeling this kind of community on the dance floor for the first time I'd never really gone on the dance floor at a house event before I'd normally just be at the bar just mm. you know go mm, okay but I was sort of involved and very loved up and just this thing this wave came over me with Robert Owen singing I'll be your I'll be your I'll be your I'll be and it was really kind of turning me on and all that kind of hairs going on the back of my neck and it just went on and on. It was just like, I'll be here, I'll be here. <laughs> I was thinking, how long is this going to go on? And I, go on, hit me, go on, hit me with the drop. And then he went, I'll be your friend. And the whole place just erupted. We all started hugging each other. And it was just a moment. And, and I'll never forget that moment. And yeah. it was, I just, in that moment, I got the soulfulness of the music and I got the feeling of togetherness that you, you would get in those days at, at a club. And that sort of collective euphoria just pissed all over me being a kind of hip-hop purist and so that was it yeah and it's funny because I've told that story a few times and then one day uh, Darren Emerson <laughs> said to me you do realize that no that I've just realized that was me DJing and I had two copies of I'll Be Your Friend and I was just it did go on as long no as you way. thought it was <laughs> he said I did it for like about a minute and a half just everybody was waiting for it to come in so um and in those days it was quite a sort of a small and knit group of, of those who, who really loved and understood music yeah um which is a very powerful thing in those days and 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 it was lovely because i was kind of welcomed into the fold all the people who 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 i'd maybe sneered at were just like oh yeah come on now you get come it come on and now yeah. you get it i mean like yeah like you said we're hearing those early records as well they could without not in that environment they can sound quite clinical and cold i suppose but once you hear them on a sound system and everyone's around you and that it's more feeling that you get that's where the home is for it, i think yeah, I mean, that, that, that old cliche of house is a feeling. It, yeah. it, it is. And it's not just the music. It's, it's, it's where you listen to it and, and what frame of mind and what ears you hear it with. So, I mean, at that point, was it okay? As much as you were a hip-hop purist, like you said, were you like, I need to ditch my record collection and get out there and start playing this new stuff? Or because you're kind of famous for the eclecticism and blending things together, did you think no. this is something I can build into my sets? It sort of crept into my sets slowly. Uh, no, I didn't become a sort of overnight convert because also at that point I would I would have been in either Beats International or Freak Bar, both of them kind of playing you know sort of the different end of the music spectrum. No, it was kind of it was my love first, and I didn't go out and buy all the records and start house DJing because I figured the house DJs did it so much better than me, you know, and they'd been doing yeah. it for a couple of years and they you know so I kind of felt like oh, well it's not you know I I like it, but in a way. A lot of times in my career, the music I like most is the stuff I'm not involved in. Okay. Because there's a definite thing that once music becomes your job, yeah. it can become your job. Yeah. And it's like I got to a point where 
most dance music that I listen to, if I listen to a really good tune, rather than listen to it simply for the enjoyment of it, I just think, why didn't I think of that? Or how can I incorporate that idea into what I do? Or how did, he, how did they do that? You know, and I would just listen to it analytically and professionally rather than the sheer joy. So at first, house music, it's, you know, I, it wasn't what I did for a living. So I could just enjoy it naturally and, and with my friends and... Uh, it would be a night off for me and I wouldn't be checking out the DJ the whole time. I'd actually just be enjoying myself. Um, but then that slowly over the next couple of years, I then tentatively attempted make it. I think so a mate of mine got me to do a remix of a house record. Um, Fidel Fatty. They just want to. Oh, no, it wasn't. No, it was uh, Esther B. Pleasure of the Dance. All right. Yeah. And they said, oh, do you want to do this? It was around the time of Black Box. And they're like, can you make this into another Italian disco cross- crossover smash? And I was like, I don't really do, you know, I'm not a au fait with house music. And they went, oh, you must be able to. So I had a go and I sort of enjoyed it. But again, I, just, I didn't want to sort of reinvent myself as, as making house music. But just gradually with it, I put out some Mighty Dubcats records, which were sort of... Yeah, I mean, like, you're kind of famous for having many different names in terms of, like, Pizza Man, Mighty Dubcats, yeah. you know, Beer and Beats International, Freak Power, etc. Like, were all of those kind of created just to service a different, scratch a different itch in terms of the genres you were... A bit of that. A bit of it was sort of contractual. Yep. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, so by this point, I'm definitely in Freak Power, so I'm signed mm. to Iron Records as a recording act, and they've given me an advance, which means my arse is theirs. Yeah. And so, but I was allowed to put out, um, I was allowed to put out 12 inch records on independent labels under false names, as long as I never admitted they were my, me. <laughs> so that was gaming game out there. But no, more so, more than just sort of contractually it was mm. and it, it, it meant I could tentatively put out house records without people going because by then I'd got quite a name for myself as a as a remixer and as a DJ yeah and you know people weren't going Judas he sold out and he's made a house record or the house people weren't going he's trying to jump on the house bandwagon so I just kind of tentatively put our records out that people didn't know were me and gradually I think it wasn't until Pizza Man that I actually nailed it the first few yeah. Mighty Dubcats records were interesting, but they weren't proper floor fillers. Yeah. But with Pizza Man, I kind of I sort of nailed it. And I was sort of helped along at that point by by my friends who ran Loaded Records, with JC and Tim, and at that child, Roger, Wild Child. Mm. Uh, and so they sort of coached, coached me into making house records, coached and coached me, actually. <laughs> And so they, and, and so, yeah, so I kind of gradually sort of wormed my way in. And then one day I was on some dreadful tour around Europe with Free Power, playing to like 37 people and like thinking, you know, when I DJ, <laughs> and, and then watching the, like Mighty Dove Kicks records be in the charts and Pete's Man records be in the charts, thinking, what the hell am I doing here, Try, pretending to be a guitarist and a songwriter when, you know, my first love was always that. And so that was when I kind of um, threw in my lot with, with trying to be in bands and be a pop star and I just you know realised that I'm a I'm a much better DJ than I'm a bass player so that was the moment where you were like okay I'm giving up on the band yeah. kind of shtick and going full on DJ what year was that? that would have been about 95 or 96 I think yeah. I was already making Fat Boy records at that point I was yeah at that point I was Fat Boy Slim Pizza Man The Mighty Dubcats and Freak Power and it was fun but exhausting yeah <laughs> Um, and something had to go and I decided to with Freak Power and, and, and just you know in terms of logistics and finances it was a no brainer like I said I could play to 50 people in some god awful club in Dusseldorf yeah. or I could you know play to you know, there'd be queues around the block to play in Brighton at the boutique or something like that yeah. so that was when we started the boutique yeah. and that was um, though by this point I'd kind of sort of moved on from house a bit Yeah, Big Beat was like kind yeah of, I mean that was the thing you know um, that whole Big Beat scene can I say it was born down here in Brighton at the, at the oh, boutique no. no no it had, a, it, had the, it was it, it spread virally very there was an outpost in Brighton no no it was sort of born in London it was born at, at the Heavenly Social oh the Heavenly Social yeah of course way more yeah. kind of um Tom and Ed yeah. and uh, Richie Fearless yeah. and John Carter and those people. Yeah. But I have sort of I was doing it in, in, in Brighton and then Lindy who Leighton who'd been the singer of Beats International, she just phoned me up and said, You know that kind of weird mix of 
music you play which is like sort of hip hop records speeded up and acid house records slowed down and, stuff. and I went yeah she went, there's, there's people doing it in London you know you should come up and see so she took me to the social and I met Tom and Ed and we were yeah. just like ah oh, kindred spirits Brilliant. but we were no but we were always Brighton was always this southern branch I mean and was that did you feel like great this is something I can really get my teeth into now having coming from like a hip hop world heavily sample culture is this something I can bring into the dance music community yeah I mean way? the whole part I've, it kind of Big Beat sounds a little bit kind of naff now looking back but at that moment it was like we'd all liked hip hop but then it got, it got a bit too gangster we'd all grown up listening to the Beatles and we'd all most of us of that age group had come had grown up through punk and punk had run, revolution, the, revolutionized the, the music business in a way of like you don't need to be a proper musician to make to start a band. Yeah. You don't have to be a, prop, a proper record label. You know, you just make press the records yourself. So we had that DIY ethic. We had the sort of pop background. Then we'd been into hip hop. Then we got into acid house. And then we were getting acid house. I mean, house had gone a bit handbaggy at that point. It was a little bit dull. And so we're like, right, rather than trying to invent a new genre, it's like, let's take the previous four, take the best bits out of the previous four and sort of mash them up. And yeah. I don't think it was a conscious decision to, to make music like that. It, for me, it was just a DJ, it's just to be more eclectic in my DJing. Yeah. And, but then when, yeah, when Lindy took me out and when I met John Carter and the Chemical Brothers and the Kahuna Brothers, uh, I just, you know, it was just like, we felt like kindred spirits. It was like, there's something going on here. And every yeah. week there was more and more people coming and it was, you know, it was, uh, again, but like punk and like Acid House, we felt like we were kind of changing the, the parameters slightly within the, the music business. Yeah, completely. I mean, a lot of the things you were looking back to and sampling were things that had never been kind of brought into that music ever before. Did you feel like it was a great excuse to go back and raid a lot of good stuff from your record collection? Absolutely, yeah, 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 <laughs> definitely. I mean, that was the thing about Big Beat. The whole idea of it was just break all the rules, all the rules of fashion, taste, behaviour, everything. But then sort of two or three years on, we sort of became the rules and it, Big Beat Records became a formula <laughs> formulaic yeah which was exactly what they weren't supposed to be which is why we kind of moved on fairly quickly yeah but yeah it was definitely we definitely felt we've got our own little thing here but it, and it was like it was like there's, there's no dress code on this one you know all previous kind of movements there was you know you this one could just exist anywhere and you wouldn't know who we were until you put put the right record on and then we'd all start misbehaving what was that final party i swear i've seen footage of you guys smashing the whole place up with a hammer is yeah that, you just take it to pieces yeah well the the, the original premises uh which is right by the pier in brighton yeah. the, the original concord was it was like a kind of scout hut kind of thing and it used to serve teas to old ladies in the afternoon and then it was just it's a little little venue in the evening and we'd been there probably three years and the place was getting redeveloped so they were knocking the place down and they, they asked me to play the last ever set there so I was like okay I said, and I just said to the owner I said can I take a little piece of the dance floor home with me because this has been you know our clubhouse this has been our cavern club you know yeah and I said can I take a little piece of the dance floor and he said bring tools he said you can take whatever you want it's going to get demolished in the morning so I brought tools. We brought a sledgehammer and saws and jemmies and things, and we took the, the club apart whilst whilst DJing. <laughs> and my favourite my favourite moment there was a big pillar in, in the middle of the stage, holding them just holding the thing up. It had always been there. And at one point, I was DJing with one hand and sawing through this pillar with the other. And then one of the pastors came running up, going no 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 no, which they very rarely said no to most things that I did in there. But he's like no no no. I was like no, it's all right. <laughs> Chris said I could do it and he went no no that's where the power lines are oh, no. so, yeah that's the only thing held us back was a tiny amount of health and safety wow and then um, so that during that era obviously as well you released Better Living Through Chemistry Come a Long Way Baby you know Halfway Between the Gutter and the Stars kind of you know three classic albums of that kind of sound at, at that point did you think okay um, Big Beat's kind of done like you said you said it almost sounded a bit cliche uh, what, what was the next step then for you as an artist I don't know confusion I mean if you listen to um, Halfway Between the Gutter and the Stars it's gone back to house yeah but with a kind of no no holds barred no rules house yeah. so and around that time I think just house music started to turn me on I think everybody had realised that, that the handbaggy sound had got a bit too samey and then, then the, the, you know the, the, the big beat back backlash happened and luckily kind of me and Tom and Ed had sort of we'd plotted a year before it's like let's get off this one so we don't go down with the ship yeah. so we sort of moved back into the house and I, you know it, it's uh, it's always been I mean that house beat whether you call it house or you call it disco 
it goes right back to you know tribal it's just a tribal thing yeah. so it's always going to be there and it's always going to have the capacity to to um to turn you on and it, and it's like an old friend who'll always welcome you back you can stray from the phone you come back but it's always there and it'll always go oh i come on in then you, you finish messing with the other people have you come back in and you said that listening to music now you kind of sometimes analyze things and is there anything of of stuff from that era that you hear back now and you're kind of like oh i wish i'd done that or i'd changed that or i'm really proud of that or is it just it's just out there and you just kind of forget about it and it is what it is I think most of the stuff I do, I try to never listen to again. Because uh, you, if you do, you always think, oh, I should have done that or so. But um, luckily, the only ones I have to listen to are the, were the really good ones. And those ones are kind of, no, there's no, there's no glaring bits that I wish I'd done differently. I mean, obviously, in terms of my overall music career, there's a thousand things that I would have done differently with the benefit of hindsight. But you can't get hung up on that. No. I could quite easily do my own head in. <laughs> Just go, oh, if only, if only, if only unset. you know, things I've said as well. Yeah. Uh, obviously, in, you know, in my younger days, I was a bit more opinionated and headstrong and possibly had a, you know, a head full of vodka. And I've said things over the things that I've, I think I've probably regretted more things that I've said rather than records that I've made or clothes that I've worn. So I've got two, one out of three isn't bad. Um, I want to talk to you about the, um, the Ibiza silent movie that came out last year, described as the loudest silent movie you could produce. Obviously, you curated the soundtrack for that. Yeah. But kind of before we come on to that element of it, can you tell us about your first experiences in Ibiza? What were those days like for you my very first one was really cool but also at the same time really not cool so 1987 i'm on holiday in ibiza with my then first wife just because it was the cheapest we, we wanted a, a summer holiday and it was the cheapest one we could find as a package and we were staying in san Anne bay in a really really rubbish hotel where the house band was a chas and dave covers band uh but we it was you know we were just lying in the sun all day listening to Gurcha and uh, rabbit all night and then and one night we're like oh we should we should really get out of San Anne Bay yeah. and you know see some of the sites and there was this you know old the Beether Old Town so we got this bus over to Beether Old Town and this is where it gets bad uh bumped into two old friends of mine from that I used to play football with in charity football matches which were Christopher Quentin and Gary Davis now I knew them both just through at my previous showbiz life yeah and they're like oh what are you doing here and I said I'm just on there and I said what are you doing there I'm just going out clubbing I was going I didn't know there was clubs on this island they went oh yeah there's this really good club called Pasha have you not heard of it I went no he said yeah there's something crazy going on in there we were there the last couple of nights and people are going mad I think they're on drugs or something so I was like that sounds fun so they took me (laughs) (laughs) Gary Davis and Chris McGuendon took me to Pasha and got me in free and that was my first taste Mm. Of, of proper Ibiza nightlife, you know, outside just like the kind yeah. of Brit bars in um, San Anne Bay. Yeah, and, and, I, and I was like, wow, this is quite interesting. But then at that point, here's where, yeah, because at that point I wasn't a house DJ, so I didn't DJ there yeah. for the next few years. Uh, and it wasn't until Manu Mission invited me and Carter to go over yeah. to play the back room. Because at that point, yeah, I wasn't a house DJ. And in fact, I've probably, my eventual, uh, I mean, pretty much all I play now is house. So that probably came from playing in... in in Ibiza where once I was getting put on in the main room I kind of had to play house all night and so I got better at it (laughs) I took it more seriously yeah um it isn't Gary Davis he I think I swear he's credited as the first person or to break 808 State Pacific on Radio 1 I mean he was out there must have been living that life Gary Davis so you said I mean you can say what you want about some of the clothes he might have worn during the 80s Mm. but no he was he genuinely loved his music and he did break a lot of uh, a lot of the cool I mean you have to remember in those days Dance music or black music or, or, or club music was never played on the radio. Yeah. Or John Peel might play it after 10 o'clock, but it was never played on mainstream radio. So you never hear these records. So in a way, Gary Davis was the conduit that he would go out clubbing with his showbiz mates and he'd hear these records and he'd put them on his show, at, you know, lunchtime on Radio 1, which is unheard of. And he broke quite a lot. Him and Peter Powell, though they might history might not remember them fondly, they did break a lot of, of club records because... The, to the rest of us living in Red Hill, we would never heard those records because there wasn't a nightclub in Red Hill that would play them. And so it was, they, they were, yeah, there was, there was a big, they were kind of the Pete Tong, as Pete Tong was to a later generation. They were the only ones translating what you would hear in the clubs to what you actually hear on Radio 1. So big up Gary Davis. <laughs> And in terms of Ibiza generally now, obviously you were there back then in 87, pre-Summer of Love. 
what are your thoughts on the kind of like journey that it's taken your whole journey through Ibiza over the years? Well, it's been fabulous. Since then, I've lived half my life quite literally there. I'm, I've met Zoe there. I go there on holiday with my kids every single year. My son's 19. He's been there every year of his life. And I've watched him from, you know, going there inside his mother's tummy to now he's clubbing. He'll probably be getting a DJ slot within the next two years I bet I bet he'll get himself a slot DJ so it's a whole generation and it's a place where I've yeah fallen in love lost got high got low everything you know and um and also musically it's been so important for DJs because it just again it would tie things in you know radio one would come there and they would you know turn more people on to what was going on there and yeah, because I met Zoe because radio. I was on her show on Radio One. That was yeah. that was the only way that they could work out and getting me on the breakfast show. Yeah, was to bring the breakfast show to Ibiza and me to go there straight from the clubs because <laughs> I would. They, I couldn't get up early enough to go to the breakfast show unless I'd been out the night before. It's a very spiritual place for me, and um, but it, it's everything. It's it's kind of it's a family place as well as a place to to rave. And um, I've got so many friends on the island, and that all tight. You know, doing the, the soundtrack to the film just cemented my my relationship with it even more. Yeah, so it's kind of putting that together. Did you feel a lot of pressure in terms of picking the right tracks, or was it just yeah going, approaching like a DJ set? It was a bit of both. There was a bit of, of of wanting it to work to tell the story. I've always I've always wanted to get involved in in film soundtracks because I love I love a good film I love a good well made film and I love the just the mechanics of storytelling it's a bit like a DJ set you kind of you trying to present something and music can be so vital to a film soundtrack it can just be so evocative or you know just heighten a scene or establish a mood or something so I was really interested in the way that I could help tell the story with the music which was handy because we had no dialogue because tons of people when I was when I was doing it, they went, well, guys, how do you, you know, how do you hold it all together with no dialogue? Because normally the, the music fits around that and it augments it. And in a, in a way, luckily we had the subtitles and the graphics, but they only came near the end before. It was trying to tell a story. So, yeah, I put an awful lot of thought and work into it. At the same time, I kind of wanted to be an ambassador for Ibiza because there was... At first, I wanted to have all the music was was made by people who either had lived on or had a connection, had a strong connection. You know, they, they've you know spent summers playing there or what. And there was tons of people going, you know, going through the rock bands that used to live there or record there and stuff. So I went through um, trying to go through the history and and also Julian Temple, the director, he's a, he's a fabulously clever and witty man, but he's, he'd never been to Ibiza before the film, so I had to kind of. T- tell him a lot of the backstory yeah and and it was good for him to come and and do it because he didn't get caught up in some of the cliches yeah the rest of us he had that fresh pair of eyes yeah he had a fresh yeah. pair of eyes but he needed me as his ears yeah so and that was quite the and then but then at the end of the day and i'm, I'm saying this for all the house purists who are listening at the end of the day the um the politics and the finances of making a film soundtrack with that amount of music on meant we couldn't afford most of the tunes that I wanted. So oh, really? if you listen to it, yeah. if you listen to it, there's a few tunes you'd go, oh, that sounds a little bit like Lurito now. <laughs> and it was basically a cheap copy of, of it because we couldn't yeah. afford the original. So there was, a lot of, there was a lot of pivotal tunes that I couldn't get in. And there was a lot of, there, but there were a couple where I insisted. But I mean, it, 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 when it started, I'm sure Julian wouldn't mind me telling him when, when it started, the opening titles were the Venger boys going to Ibiza. <laughs> And I sort of, I saw this the first bit I saw. I went, right, okay, Jenny, you need me here. <laughs> you need to know that this record has never been played on the island of Ibiza. Yeah. It's played by idiots around the rest of, you know, the Costa Brava. And <laughs> that it would never be played on the island. And it's just wrong and naff. And, you know, the Venga boys would be lynched if they ever tried to go to Ibiza. And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah. He's like, okay. And he, bless him, we, it did take three or four months of me t- having pointing this out. But I'd see another rough cut. I was like, you've still got the Venga boys on the open credits, <laughs> Julian. This is good. So, um, yeah, so there's just things like that. Yeah. Things like yeah. that. And, and just knowing which tunes. But then things like Gibbero and things like that, to, to get them in, he would have never known about that tune in a million yeah. years and wouldn't know what it means to, to, mm. to people who've been there for a long time. So, yeah, yeah it was great. But, uh, yes, um, I'd just like to apologise to all the people who... Uh, well, actually, no, not apologise to the people who wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't do us, cut us any deals. 
and it premiered at Glastonbury mm. as well a, a place again that's very special to you um, obviously you've played how many times have you played there how many different places have you played in Glastonbury would you say I've played all the major stages over the years and I've played every every year that it's been on since 96 wow yeah which I think I can't do the mass but it's a lot yeah and what's your if you can remember any highlight preference of place to play obviously everything's different it's all good that's what I love about Glastonbury it's Everywhere you go, there's something funny going on and there's somebody beautiful to meet and talk to and get to know. And it can be from all walks of life. And I've been lucky enough that I can trawl around. You know, I've had fabulous evenings in the Rabbit Hole and the Blues Shack mm-hmm. is great. But at the same time, I've been lucky enough to play on the, the other stage. We, had a, uh, we did it in the John Peel tent the other year. That was really, really took the roof off. I mean, in one year, I actually did a tour of Glastonbury. Gastonbury tour <laughs> where we play six shows over oh over four days yeah and all in different you know like yeah. big and small and and it's lovely because everyone is if different but it's still got that kind of unifying Glastonbury abandon yeah and you know lack of pretension and just kind of no nonsense let's see how much we can make each other smile and um yeah so I'm so I'm lucky that I haven't always just been in in you know in Silver Haze or in in the Shangri-La or I can yeah. I can literally dot about, you know, in my little backpack with a laptop and my headphones on my back, and I just yomp around. <laughs> can I play? Up at <laughs> and is it is it true? I swear, it's probably 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 whatever you're about to say. <laughs> yes, probably um, that you don't take any payment from any gigs for Glass. Yes, days. yes, yeah, do it gratis. Uh, that was only because I didn't. I, I did it one year, and then I think they just thought, "Oh, bless him, he doesn't. He, he, he doesn't need to get." I didn't realise I was supposed to get paid. I, I just thought he did it for free. I thought he did it for the love. Wow. But I mean, most of the side gigs, you do for the love anyway. Yeah. Um, but I kind of, on the one hand, I, I think it was Glastonbury who said who leaked that that, that I never, <laughs> I never cashed the checks. But I would equally, I would counter that that Glastonbury have given me a, a healthy guest list of all my family and friends who we go as a little gang and they've always given us tickets every year whether or not I'm officially on the bill they know I'm going to turn up anyway and play somewhere you know in block nine so I get they give me a, an allocation of tickets every year and, and I, I, I will thank them for, forever for that they don't want you turning up and playing and then you're charging them for it <laughs> no I think they I, I don't know what they I, for me it was that's the reason I played every year because I think mm. if one year they didn't give me I had to they said you've got to buy a ticket this year I'd figure that that's their way of saying Norman you can't just turn up and play every single year but they always have so I figured it is alright for me to go back and play there there you go and you're playing there this year this year I'm officially on the bill yeah um, I'm not sure <laughs> A, by the time we <laughs> you hear this podcast, oh. <laughs> A, whether Glastonbury will still be on, or B, whether it'll have been announced yet. But I, this year, I'm actually on the official bill. Fantastic. And um, you're also involved in a Sweet Harmony exhibition at the Saatchi Gallery um, last year. Not so much. The, no, you, I did played, you DJ I, at the party? I played at a party of the closing night with yes. Carl for yeah. my charity. And they were just some, they were generous enough to donate the, the closing party to be a a ticketed charity show for us. Great. But I wasn't involved in, in that the curation of the it. curation of that art show. But I do have a penchant for art curation these days. Just was trying to lead up to... But, uh, uh, I, suppose I like it. Nice segue there. Okay, right? yeah, I like what you did there. <laughs> um, I suppose there's two prongs on that. Is um, Why? <laughs> <laughs> um, the back-to-back aspect of playing with Carl Cox. Oh, yeah. I suppose, who do you love playing back-to-back with? How do you approach doing that? And is it a case of working together or kind of a one-upmanship? It's a bit of all of them. It's a bit of all of the above. It's, there's a, the, currently, there's only two DJs that I back-to-back with. Mm-hmm. One is Carl and the other is Dan Eats Everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's because I trust them and because I know that we kind of have a similar mindset and we know where we're going mm-hmm. and we know it'd be good. Because the trouble with back-to-backing is just over the years, it's just become... It's kind of a way of putting two more names on on the flyer, and some of them are interesting and some of them productive. Some of them it just felt like they were glued together for the sake of it, or it's some kind of weird jousting competition. Now, for me, DJing was never meant to be competitive. It's not a competitive sport. But having said that, if there's someone you know well enough, you are always egging. You know, if it when it works, I mean, and I've done it over the years. I've not done it. With, I'm not hoard about too much. I used to do it with Armand Van Helden, mm-hmm. and we definitely used to spar each other. It would be like, okay, 
see that I'll raise you that and you go ah oh, oh, okay I'll see you and I'll raise you that and it does it makes you up your game and it really yeah. you know there's, there's that good element of competition but I've heard tales of DJs trying to screw each other over and, and it's just like no one wins it's like yeah. for the crowd they want to see either two people who know each other well and work in harmony or two people who are sparring each other off to make a better show but for them not for self-indulgence and not for their own jousting you know, uh, bragging rights are like, yeah, I, I fucked him up. You know? <laughs> so yeah, it's it's a it's a weird beast back to backing. But yeah. um, like I said, Carl and Dan are the only people I, I kind of know and trust well enough to to, to do it with them. Yeah. And especially with me and Dan, it does we do become this kind of sort of comedy techno double act. <laughs> so he makes me play more techno. And I kind of inject a bit more... Com- Actually, not, there's not quite a lot of comedy in dance sets anyway, but <laughs> yeah, we definitely work together, uh, work well together as a, as a double act. Yeah, and to talk about your art curation as well, and because um, you collect smileys, right? I collect smileys, but I also collect art. I mean, I collect art generally, um, but particularly smiley art. Yeah. And I... Over the years, I've sort of had dalliances with artists. There's an artist called Riker, yeah. who does a lot of my graphics and then uh, my some of the bigger gigs he does the merch store and he actually paints t-shirts with stencils and that so he makes everyone personalised t-shirts and we do strange things where we give away the smile we, do, we go around the town in the afternoon putting smiley art in places and leaving it for people to find so I've been having kind of flirtations with, with artists and a lot of my I've sort of become friends with a lot of um, artists and one of them was a, was a Portuguese guy called Veals and I DJed with him and used some of his visuals in my show and we were sort of collaborating. And in the midst of that, he said, I've got, a, um, I've got this uh, gallery in Lisbon. We've got nothing on in July. Do you want to do an exhibition? And I'd never, I'd never really thought of it before, but it seemed like it might be fun. And it was. It was really good. To be walked through it by, by Veals and his people and, and a good friend of mine, Joe Brooks, who kind of walked me through it. But it was really fun. It was kind of using some of my sort of showbiz experience, but also being in a whole different place. But try, but curating it in the way you would a DJ set, you know, just just going with on instincts, like, well, I like that, so I like that, and then that might fit together with that, and then that, that was how I would present it to you. So, and I really enjoyed it, and no one, you know, none of the people at the gallery was like, what the hell are you doing here, you twat, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. The artists all loved it, all loved, you know, and, and they didn't mind me t- saying, oh, can you do that or make that a bit bigger? So I just enjoyed the, the relationship with the artists, the relationship with, uh, with the art world. Mm-hmm. Uh, but most of all, just with the, with the people. I t- would just spend afternoons just like with a hat on. So no one recognised me, just watching people, watching the, their reactions and, yeah. you know, who was getting the most Instagram <laughs> kicks. And, uh, yeah, I just really in- in- enjoyed watching people in the way that I enjoy watching people dance. And I like it when I put a record on and everyone goes, woo, like that. It gives you a real kill. So it was a kind of art version of that. Yeah. And I really enjoyed it. And, 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 you know, no one said, you fake what you're doing or, you know, why are you pissing about in the art world? You know nothing about it. People yeah. are like, well, that's really good that you brought a different slant to it and introduced some new artists and, and, and work with people. So, yeah, I mean, I was lucky enough to work with like, the London police who, I, those of you who know art, London police who I, who I really loved. Uh, and Veals and Riker and Chemical X um, and James Joyce. Oh, God, I'm, who am I going to forget <laughs> now and get told off? Um, and so that's something that I could see continuing yeah, in so the future. That's just been a one-off so far. So you? far it's been a one-off. At the time of doing this podcast, um, again, coronavirus allowing... Uh, we are going to be putting a smiley exhibition, a smiley art exhibition in the foyer of the Human Traffic Extravaganza oh, yeah. at Printworks. Yeah, Printworks. Like I said, fingers crossed. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge thing that's going on there, isn't it? For yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's a month long, isn't it? Is it like every it's, night there's a different... 18 like... shows, 18 shows. And it's really, really ambitious. Yeah. Really ambitious. There's, there's a kind of uh, an exhibition, sort of ray-based exhibition on and then food trucks, and then an immersive theatrical, all singing, all dancing performance of the film. And then you get your regu- regular print work, works gig after it. And they've tr- kind of got, and they've, they've been very um, reverential, like everyone who's involved in the film, like Carl and, mm-hmm. 
and um, well, me. <laughs> uh, they've got tried to get everyone back in, and then they put they pulled in all the old school DJs who were around twenty years ago when the film came out. And it's amazing how well the film. I mean, I showed my nineteen year old raving son the film a couple of weeks ago. And he was just like, oh, it was like, yep, nothing's changed in 20, no, 20 years of clubbing. No. And it's pretty much the same themes and yeah. The, yeah, the same characters you meet. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I was 19 when that film came out and it's like, that was my life on yeah. screen. It's yeah, incredible. Yeah, I mean, there very few films, I think, can capture club culture. Yeah. No, especially Hollywood, Hollywood films. They have a club scene. You're like, oh, Christ, really? have you ever been to a nightclub? They're not like that. <laughs> and that was the first one that actually captured the, the yeah. atmosphere and the culture of, of clubbing and yeah so I'm quite happy to be part of it yeah um sadly contractually I'm not I wasn't allowed to DJ no just because I was playing love box I couldn't play I couldn't DJ I can't DJ at the in the after party print works thing but you're contributing in the in <laughs> I couldn't publicly play at the uh, after party <laughs> Um, might yeah, never so be I would, seen there but I, would, I would, because, because it was my tune it was the opening credits of the film I really wanted to be part of it yeah, in some way yeah. and they have got tons of space and wanted us to do so yeah so we're doing part two of the, the Smiley exhibition Smile High Club Amazing. at Printworks I hope unless it do, unless we don't yeah it's all touch and go isn't it I think yeah. at the moment with a lot of stuff um, and, oh, talking about kind of playing live and you mentioned Lovebox as well uh, your stage show at the, it's like absolutely huge. It's you know it's come a long way from the Concord two decks. Now it's this huge audio visual experience with confetti cannons and all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, do, do you think that kind of adds a lot of pressure to you as an artist to deliver that? Only if I had to do that for a living. Luckily, that's not my living. <laughs> uh, that's just something we do in the summer when when we do the big festivals. Ninety five percent of the rest of the shows I do aren't like that at all. Yeah. Um, no, the big shows, when we do the big arena shows, we like to throw, uh, and, it, and it's fun to do, but I wouldn't want to do it all year round yeah. because you're playing big arenas that I don't really feel that. You're trying to inject soulfulness into a you know, very sanitised environment. And until last year, I'd never, never knowingly played an arena in my life. But just because I thought, you know, our, our music doesn't belong in there or our you know, club culture. Mm. But we can use the bells and whistles and playing in the round. We can use that to break up that and make it feel. And, and it's like, OK, this isn't, you know, as, 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 as cosy as your neighbourhood club, but it, your neighbourhood club can't do this. <laughs> so, um, but no, but most of my, most of the DJing, when you say my my show, yeah, yeah, that's just the big show. But then the rest of the time, I'm doing just my normal show. And for that ying, there's a yang, which means I was at a dirty Polish. Tech, I played two sets in one night at a techno, Polish techno club on Friday, and a raving Croatia on Saturday night. And next week, I'm playing Watergate. Yeah, so I, I can I like the fact that I'm still allowed to play dirty techno clubs. Yeah, and ha- get my jollies. And, and I mean, over the years, I kind of we it got bigger and bigger because we were just being put on bigger stages, and it got to a point where I'm on a stage, and I'm thinking, I've got to do more than just stand there and play records yeah. to people. So I started waving my arms around, and that, that bought me another couple of years. But then it's like I could do more than stand here. Um, and it came from one. It came from one night when I did tea in the park, and I was headlining over the Foo Fighters. So Foo Fighters went on beyond me. They've just done their whole kind of show, and you know, guitar solos, and you know, and then <laughs> they got all their gear off, all this gear. And they just put a table at the front with two record players on it, and <laughs> I was like, "How the fuck are we going to top that?" So we had to raise our game production-wise, yeah. and around that time, screens and and Serato Video allowed you to start doing more. So the, yes, we've tried to make the big show bigger, yeah. but at the same time, I appreciate the smaller shows more because i can i can take more risk and i have fun yeah. the thing is with the big show is kind of it's not, i wouldn't say it's rehearsed but there's certain patterns and certain tunes once i've made the visual for a tune we kind of use it for a year or two yeah um and so you end up playing the same tunes for a year or two which is more i want to do wholly for my living but it works on that on those bigger stages and yeah and um, your preference, obviously, you're talking, you, you know, this, you, your face lighting up when you're talking about playing dirty techno clubs in, yeah. in Poland. Like, is it is it that intimate space where you can see the whites of the eyes of the people that you're playing these records to? Yeah, and, but also it's just a, it's a more of a shared experience. The bigger the stage you are, the more lonely you are up there, even though there's more people, but you're more lonely. 
And the biggest mm. stage is you're kind of 20 foot from your own people. You know, mm. you're just, it's like, it's a two minute walk to the wings. And all you're doing is just being a performing monkey. And you're trying your best to try and project to this huge audience. Mm. And it's fun, but it's, it's, it's work. It's hard. I find it quite hard work. Yeah. Whereas if I'm just in the corner of a nightclub, playing tunes and wandering off at tangents then that's that's why I got into this you know that's the bit I loved yeah. that I got into and it's yeah it's the it's the most honest and and I take risks and I play different tunes you know I play a way way more interesting set when I play in a smaller place yeah because it's kind of lot lowest common denominator and and also I'm having I'm having genuine fun and I'm having more of a rapport with the audience because I can actually see them yeah I can touch them because you think how far away are those big stages at Creamfields or something like that on the main stage, you're 30 foot from from the, the, the audience. And it's yeah. hard to get any kind of... It's it's all one-sided. It's all just you just giving it the large one. Yeah. And then somewhere, you know, you're just seeing the hands in the air in the distance. But when you're in a club, it's a two-way conversation. It's sometimes quite literally, you know. And and I love that and I thrive on that. And that's, um, that's, that's, what, that's how I really get my fun. I mean, that's the bit that I always used to do as a hobby before it became my job. Yeah. And I still like to keep that as, as a hobby of love rather than a job. And is it the most joyful experience with just watching something you're giving to that audience and watching the joy they're experiencing back? The really joyful bit is when it actually becomes a conversation of, I'll do something and that will give them so much joy that they start doing something that gives me tons of joy. And you just get this vicious circle of like how, you know, how stupid can we get or how deranged can we get or how sexy can we get you know and it just you get this sort of ongoing thing that they make me play better and yeah. then so then I'll try something new and then that'll go down you know and, and it, it, yeah they kind of they egg me on and and it's spontaneous yeah. it's spontaneous and it's very much a community thing it's like everyone it becomes a part of it Whereas the, the big shows, it's kind of them and us. It's you on stage and it's them over there. Yeah, I, I mean, like you said, like I suppose if you've made the visuals or something, you already go in there with a preconceived notion of those beats you've got to hit. Whereas in a club, if it's that two-way communication, everyone's influencing what you're doing as well as you're influencing yeah. What, yeah. what they're doing. Yeah, and just you can you can just wander off the beaten path and meander around and see where you end up. Yeah, you know, a gig. There's a there's a there's a there's a, a route and <laughs> you've got to get from there to there and, the, and there's pretty much there's only one road between there and there yeah. this you can just meander and if you end up over there it doesn't matter because there was no you know the, you, you haven't got an encore to hit yeah. you know you haven't got the pyro bit it's like okay, I've got to get into right here right now and time for, you know and it, it, yeah it becomes it becomes it becomes I mean it, it, it's, it's a nice satisfaction to pull off a big show and to, to wow the crowds but for me that's work yeah. And and DJing at a club is is fun. It's great you've got them both in there. In terms of that eclecticism, you said you can kind of meander and, and take different routes and whatever. How how do you discover that new music right now and how, what kind of keeps you inspired? Anyway, it's like gone are the days really where it's kind of like going into a record shop. It's all kind of shifted no, online. I how just, is that? I just trawl the net probably two, three hours a day on average. I get sent so much stuff. I probably get about... 60 tunes a day on, on weekdays you listen to them all yeah I give them at least all at least 10 seconds yeah uh, but obviously if it's a drum and bass record or a trance record yeah yeah, yeah. Like, um, but no I, I, I check them all out and then I just go trawling around Beatport or just following threads around the world so I'm always on the hunt and it's not as much fun as hanging around and spending all Wednesday afternoon chatting to other DJs in a record shop and then getting a pile and sitting there listening through them all but it's um, there's I still get the same buzz because if I have to wade through four hundred tunes to get one good one, boy am I happy when I hear that good one. <laughs> I just still get that buzz, and then I can't wait to play it out. And then yeah. it's like, and then when I play it, and then I'll maybe you know do, edit it a bit, and then I'll play it out, and then it's, kind of like, it's like oh, and that is the kind of the process. That's the the journey's end for me. Yeah, because for me, the, the there's people who when they hear a record they like. It's like, okay, I'm going to put it out on my Spotify playlist and then they might listen to it on the way to work. And, or if they're really into it, they might, I might just sit on in my bedroom at home, listen to it on the headphones, you know, over and over again. Me, when I hear a tune I like, I can only enjoy it by sharing it with other people. And it's this weird compulsion that if I hear it, I can't just sit there and just go, yeah, this is really good. I have to tell someone, I have to persuade somebody else that it's really good, or, or they have to agree with me that it's really good. And for some, that's for some reason, that's 
way the way I get my kicks out of music. But I mean, that's the they're those kind of people. That's why we become the DJs. <laughs> and uh, like, yeah, you you listen to all of that music. Does when you find that one, does it does it always jump out at you? You know that that's going to work. Is it just a feeling inside or... Yeah, it's just an instinct. And sometimes you listen to it and then on, you know, a rainy Tuesday afternoon and you think it's going to work and then you play it on a big thing and it doesn't. And then sometimes the one that you weren't quite sure about, it really, when you play it in front of other people really loud, all of a sudden it becomes, it takes on a different um, entity. But no, I just, I don't know what the criteria are. And some people, when I tell them about how much you get sent on mailing lists and they're like, oh, we don't, don't you have someone who does that for you? You know, because some DJs apparently have, D, you know, people sort of... I'm like, I wouldn't trust anybody else no, to know yeah. what... what Because I don't know what it is that I like. Yeah. So yeah. I couldn't trust anybody else to choose, pick the records for me. And no, it's just, it's just an, it's a, a, an instinct that I've always had about music that I found that generally tends to work. Whether it's, it's a tune I'm making or DJing for someone else. If I think, oh, that sounds a bit good generally i've quite a good quite good ears and i've got quite a good sort of success ratio of knowing when something's good which i think is probably how i've got away with being a dj for all these years so uh this is not my mixing <laughs> my mixing abilities that's for sure uh so yeah i mean i think there's a, a an instinct that, that that good djs have that yeah. you know and you might not necessarily know what it is it's just is it catchy does it work does it grab you and you can tell quite instantly because if you think they're only going to hear it once. Not kind of, oh, yeah, after 10 listens, this will really get under your skin. It's like you've got to hit them with that first listen. It's got to yeah. be something that a groove that they just instinctively go with. So I just figure if I instinctively go with it, they probably will, hopefully. That's the extent of the science of it. And it's just putting in the hours, just sitting there, just going through them all. Wow. And is there anything, is there a compulsion to create new music at the moment from yourself? No, absolutely not, sadly. There was, yeah. There was for many years, and it just sort of tailed off. And I don't know if it's just I'm getting old. Some of it's definitely the technology involved. I don't get to. I used to get really turned on by abusing drum machines <laughs> and synthesizing, seeing where you could, you know, yeah. play them wrong. And laptops, everything's kind of there on a plate for you, and you can't overload things, and you can't, you can't break rules. Yeah. And also, you're just faced with unlimited possibilities and every single synth at your fingertips and I don't know where to start so yeah the process doesn't turn me on the idea of making I've, I'm I kind of the thing I like least about the whole music business is trying to sell records to people yeah. and once you've made a record you've then committed to you've got to do interviews and videos and things like that and I don't enjoy that bit anymore I used to yeah but I don't enjoy that anymore and you know I kind of I look at my kids and I think have I got anything to say relevant to you? And as a man of my age, when we're going to come, am I going to come up with concept, concepts like they know what is what, they don't know what is what, they just struck, what the <laughs> fuck? You know, I, it, my brain doesn't really work like that anymore. Yeah. So, yeah, I think maybe I'm just getting old, but I, it might not be forever. At the moment, I'm so turned on by DJing, so turned on by DJing and sharing the music I live and traveling the world and everything um, that I just get no pleasure about being in the studio. Last time I made a record, I just really didn't enjoy it. When we eat, sleep, rave, repeat. It was all right when we first put it out, but then when it got a sniff of the charts, all of a sudden I'm just, there's all this just sucking corporate dick that you know, I'm not prepared to do as I get yeah, older. Yeah. And making videos. It's like, I don't, why, is, why do we have to make a video? It's like, because that's what you do when you put a record out. So, um, yeah, so I've fallen out of the, the, the record making process and the record selling process. Mm. But the playing other people's records process, I love. And, and, it, and it, it fills up my year. It's not like I'm, 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 you know, sitting around scratching my navel, though I might be this summer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, with Coachella going down today. Oh, is thinking. that gone, is it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's gone back to October. Oh, no way, okay. Um, but yeah, that's the first of my, first of what many, might be many cancellations for me this summer. So maybe I'm, maybe this will be the summer I go back into the studio because <laughs> I've got no, because, yeah, I've got no other gigs. No, I think I might, I might, at one point feel that I'm too old to be traveling around the world and DJing or I might feel just too old to be a DJ yeah. and then I might go back in the studio but at the moment I'm it, I'm quite happy as being a DJ and you mentioned your 19 year old son potentially getting a gig in a couple of years in Ibiza or something like that do you think 
Uh, is this a path that you would recommend for him, like being looking at it through a father's eyes to your son? I prefer him to be a DJ and a bloody reality TV star, that's for sure. <laughs> Bless him, We've t- we have talked about it, because obviously, like I wanted him to play for England, I probably I would have hoped him, for my you know firstborn son, to be a DJ too. But he quite rightly pointed out that he probably that he would constantly live under my shadow. He's like, you've kind of ruined DJing for me. That's what he said. He said you've kind of re- ruined DJing because I'll always just be your son and compared to you. And um, so, you know, he does odd. Now he's a reality TV star. He gets those kind of personality gigs. Yeah. And I've taught him the rudiments of mixing, but we'll see if that progresses or not. I don't think it's an avenue he really wants to do. Fair enough. And um, I want to talk about, I saw on Instagram the other day, you've recently celebrated... 11 years of sobriety, is that yeah. right? I, I'm not going to be the poster boy for sobriety. Yeah. I had most fun for 32 years and left no stone unturned when it came to uh, self-abuse and partying. Uh, and then it got to a point where it was, it, it was hurting and it wasn't fun anymore and it, didn't, it wasn't tenable. So I stopped and it was quite hard to do. And it's not anything that I'd recommend anyone to do unless you feel you ought to uh, or those around you feel that you, you know it's a problem but obviously if your your physical or mental health is being you know is suffering through over partying then you do have to kind of have a word with yourself which is why I, ha- I had to do yeah. and it's been great for me I mean I've, you know I don't think I'd be physically able to do the the, the, the traveling and the late nights I do if I was still partying um, so it's brought, brought longevity to my career and possibly my life. But like having said that, I don't want to bang on. I, you know, my advice to you kids is like party for as long as you can, for as, <laughs> as hard as you can, for as long as you can, and then give up when it starts hurting. It's good advice. No, but having said that, uh, the, uh, the the mental health thing is, uh, I think it's just part of our society now that we're finally waking up to the fact that some of the doubts or fears or troubles that we've always kind of, just kept buried or secret are actually a, an illness that you shouldn't be ashamed of and you should be able to talk to your friends about uh, and the world about and if you do talk to other people about it it can sometimes really help I think like uh, like homosexuality was in the Victorian times or like dyslexia was in the in the 50s and the 60s it was just something that, that it wasn't talked about and when you get it out in the open and, and, and talk about it, it, it helps and it makes it less. Uh, and now whether you're a DJ or whether you're just a, anyone, I think you have to be open about your mental health and talk about it. Yeah. And, and I've had problems over the years and, and talking to other people has really helped. And it's, yeah, it's, that, it can be very, very serious. And, and obviously I've, there's been people around me, it's taken its toll on. And you never... You never want to think that there was uh, that something was suppressed or not mentioned that, uh, to the detriment of someone's health. I mean, certainly some of the other DJs that we've spoken to on the podcast, uh, like Brandon Block, etc., you know, certainly lived that life. When it starts to take its toll, um, it's something to start thinking about, kind of stepping back from. I mean, it is like a from what we found as well, other DJs, it can be a very lonely life in terms of like you are sometimes on your own traveling around the world traveling alone in a hotel there are certain pressures i would i don't think djs i mean the 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 whole avici thing triggered off a whole thing of like you know is it a bad you know lifestyle was that what killed him and i don't think i think it's too simplistic to see that but also you look at it it's like yes we do you know yes it's quite glamorous but yes it's like lots of long hours but when i'm not going to be the one that moans about travel or loneliness or anything to do with DJ compared to real people who've got real jobs and their lives you know we don't we're not we shouldn't be singled out that we're potentially more likely to have problems or that it's somehow not our fault you know fully aware that it's quite a weird life we live but but I don't think we can moan and I think um but you, you can't hide behind it and say well it was it was you know DJ you're all responsible for your own kind of mental well-being and yeah, can't blame there. Oh, the pressures of DJing, darling. You're ensconced in Brighton down here. Obviously, it's been your home for how long? Nearly 40 years, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, I came down here to go to college when I was 18. You're heavily involved in lots of community things down here as well. How important is it for you to have a sense of community in place and a base? 
I think it's really important. In fact, going back to what we were talking about, DJ's mental health, that's probably one thing that's really helped me is that I didn't live out the suitcase all the time. When I come home, I've got a very, very definite home where I feel I belong. And not just family, like Brighton is kind of a wider, my sort of wider family. And I think it's quite important because a lot of DJs they end up sort of moving to LA or something like that. And I think that would discombobulate me. Yeah. So I've always had been a very homely person when I come home, I've got my kids and, um, and uh, yeah, like I said, Brighton has just become my extended family. It's a sort of two way love affair. They like the fact that, that I stayed living here when I should have moved up to London. Cause that's what's the done thing when you become successful. Uh, and they love that I brought Zoe down here and they and then I love that they love me and then they love that I like the Albion and then I love the Albion it just becomes this kind of sort of uh, reciprocal loving over mm. the years which is nice and, it, and it's, it's kind of nice because Brighton's a sort of small, it's small enough place that everybody has probably said hello to me at some point so that I don't get bothered <laughs> well, that, well just people are just like alright Norm but no, no one makes a fuss I'm kind of part of the furniture down here yeah. and but I'm very, I'm very proud of this city. I think it's a very, it's it's a very, it's a it's a beautiful place to live. It's a very creative place. It's a very tolerant place. It's a very forward thinking place. It's full of lovely people, and I'm I'm very proud of that. And that's why I've stayed here. And then while I'm here, I might as well get involved in what I can. And uh, yeah, so I, I'd like to get involved in community things and charity things and football things and. Mm you know, not just events. Yeah, we just hit the hour mark on here. So we always ask for five tracks. Oh, yes. You all know the stories behind those tracks. Yeah, so just your, car- I've written them down for you just Good, in case you've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, based on five themes, and these go in the Spotify playlist that our listeners can listen to. Obviously, all of our guests have contributed to these. It's potentially building what we see as the perfect playlist. So you've already kind of talked about... Um, but also the caveat of, like curating the Ibiza film, I had to change what I was forced to change. Yes, one of my yeah, things down to it wasn't on Spotify. We won't mention which one was the replacement <laughs> one. Feel so on. Yeah, so we've had a few like that as well, which is disappointing. We've already kind of mentioned the catalyst. Yeah, so the catalyst was uh, Robert Owens. I'll be your friend, and we've told that story. Indeed, my go-to floor filler is the Cube Guys version of Psycho Killer. Yeah, the Talking Heads. Uh, sure. Yeah, which is yeah David Byrne's vocal. Yeah, um, over a kind of acid house revamp. Which just, it just, it just, I don't, I've always, I, that, I grew up on that song. Yeah. And that was the song that got me into Smiley's because the cover of the original 12 inch in 1977 was a Smiley t shirt. Really? And it's kind of ironic, but it was the first time I kind of registered the Smiley. Yeah. So that, for that reason, also, that, it means a lot to me. Also, the Cube Guys, I'm a really big fan of their, I just, yeah. we, we've got the same kind of mind in how music should be. I, I play a lot of their stuff and, and we're kind of pen pals. So big up to the Cube guys and, and David Byrne and another compatriot of mine, Psycho Killer. Um, the perfect track to soundtrack, the Sunset, is Groove Amada at the river. I don't know, it, it requires no explanation really, does it? Um, all I, I just suffice to say that I turned my own son onto it all these years later. Well, 20 years later. Yeah. And he's 20. Yeah. And, he, and I played it to him and he, like, he didn't say much, but then about two nights after he'd had a sesh and he's like, that that Groove Mile track was like that was the tune of the session. It's totally in my head now. It's like I can't get it out of my head. It's like yes, another soul is mine. <laughs> uh, Tearjerker, yeah, emotional songs. Um, immediately in and out of my life by One Fat Diva came to mind simply because that's the last time I can remember spontaneously bursting into tears whilst DJing. And uh, yeah, I hadn't played it for ages. Uh, the, this, this, it, well, basically, the the gist is, it's uh, it's the rhythm track of uh, right here, right now, yeah. which someone did a bootleg with a diva's. Um, is it called In and Out of My Life? Yeah, I can't remember the original song, but it was a, it was a, an a diva tune. Um, the, the, there was an acapella, and they put the acapella of that over right here and now, and it actually got an official release called One Fat Diva, spelled with a ph. In and out of my life, and I hadn't played it for years. And I, just, I suddenly remembered it because it used to be really big in my yeah. crate. And I thought I'd play it, and I played it. And it was just when I was going through a difficult time in my personal life. And it was just like all of a sudden, after playing it for 20 years, the lyric I suddenly listened to the lyrics and started singing them really loud. And it the whole song came, I'd never really paid attention before, but the whole thing suddenly came alive to me. 
And it was suddenly I was right in the middle of her story, and I just burst out crying. Lost <laughs> <laughs> me, Jay. So no, I'm often I've kind of sort of brought to tears a little bit, you know. If yeah. I've, you know, there's some moments where you just like, oh. But this actually, I was actually crying. <laughs> I was like, oh god. So yes, um, well done, Adiva, for taking a grown man apart like that. Just in terms of that track, did you find it ironic in a way hearing someone sample your work back to you? No, it was just it was just because. Because it had been part of my work, it was like, oh, that was one of my tunes within the thing, and now that's a hit, so, you know, I play, can play it for another six months in my sets. It was... I had never stopped and listened to the lyrics of it. It yeah. was always just a tune, so I never stopped and enjoyed it as a piece of music. It was just something that I played in my sets. But then after 20 years not playing it, to put it back and, and hear it with a fresh pair of ears, there was something in there that I'd completely missed, which triggered quite a lot in me. It's incredible how music can do that sometimes. Yeah, well, that's coming back to what I was saying before about music not becoming your job. Yeah. It's, it, it can be the most emotive. It can lift you up when you're down. It can console you when you're down. It can, it, it can be the sound. You know, I, I always see it as just the sound. If my life's a film, then music is the soundtrack. And you know, there's the love theme and there's the, you know, the theme for each person. Most of my friends, there's a track that would always remind me of them at least one it's like their theme tune that I hear in my head when I'm <laughs> walking down the street and yeah and, and music I think music and smell are the two most evocative things for me in my life that can can stir my emotions I always bore my friends with the with the story oh Matt shut up about the first time I heard this track because I can always remember sometimes the first time I heard those tracks and yeah. this DJ played it there or I was in this club there and just that feeling that I had and you know half my friends were inter- kind of interested the other half were like oh god he's banging on about the first time he heard something again it's weird every time I can't I've got a terrible I really love football but I've got a terrible head. I can't remember who we played last week I can't remember the names of half I played my, my I've kind of, I can retain knowledge about labels and b-sides and producers but I can't retain any football knowledge yeah and every time anyone asks, says, what's the first football match you went to? I know it was Charlton Athletic versus Chester, but I don't know what the score is, what the score was, but I do know what tune, two tunes they played at half time. <laughs> they were. <laughs> Which were? Which was David Cassidy, How Can I Be Sure? And Mouldy Old Doe like, by Lieutenant Pigeon, which was on Decker by the film. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, I can God. remember these. So, wow. yeah, and that was my association with going to my first football match. Yeah. was summed up by the music that was playing, not by the score of the, the, score of the game. That's incredible. And, yeah, just that magpie knowledge, I suppose, has kind of got you here today. Hopefully, yeah. I think as a DJ, I'm not sure as a musician it, it does you that good, but as a DJ, it's good to have, be able to retain knowledge. It's a bit, it's a bit like playing um, Happy Families. Yeah. It's like you just remember there's something over there that would go with that. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah. We'll put that one with that. So, yeah, I think um, it probably does help. I'm quite OCD about record collecting and and just generally about music and uh, that, yeah. How good are you at remembering a set you've just played? Like, for instance, you were playing out the other day. Can you remember exactly what you played or is, is it just a kind of... No, not... It just happens and that's compartmentalised, that was that yeah, night? Yeah, because... Th- most most DJing is kind of in the moment. It's just mm. an instinct, and you just you're looking around at people, and then you look at your list of tunes, and then something clicks between what's going on out there and what's going in on in your in your crate, and you make a connection. And think, oh, that, or, or or that would go with that tune, and that will take them to where I want them to go next, or where they want to go next. So there's much more of a of a. It's just a like I said, it's a journey you go on together and at the end of it, you can't necessarily remember exactly what the route was, but you do remember where you ended up. Whereas I, I can remember what's in the crate and how it goes and how it starts and how it ends and where the drops are. Yeah. That bit I need to retain, but the what order I played them on Saturday night doesn't really matter. Unless, but again, unless when you get to the arena gigs, I could probably tell you what I played at Cardiff <laughs> because it was pretty much the same as what I played in Nottingham the night before <laughs> so yeah the big shows I kind of have to stick to a more of a set list and there'll be yeah. one one space where I can I could either play that or that but yeah that's therein is the difference between completely it's between the two sets yeah and what would be obviously we asked for a last tune on there a last tune end of the crowd yeah the, the crowd are asking for one more so I'm going to give them John Paul Young Love Is In The Air just because uh, I don't normally play encores. Normally I've kind of got my big finish and I'll finish with 
right here right now and then praise you and it's like that's it done i'm not a rock band i don't do encores but if they really refuse to go home and the promoter's like i'll play one more then i'll go off the off the beaten track and that yeah love is in the air is kind of that's started at glastonbury rob the bank played it that sunday best yeah at tea time on a sunday when i'd completely lost all attachment to reality and it took me to a, such a beautiful place it's such a joyful track it's, yeah and it, yeah. and but i don't i don't it's i don't i don't knock it out uh willy-nilly yeah it only comes out on very special moments that's good a good last tune and our final question is always um we are obviously house culture and you've been involved in kind of the the culture of dance music the wider dance music community as well throughout your whole career what does this culture mean to you personally and what do you think the future of it is are you surprised that it's lasted this long i'm glad you called it house culture rather than dance culture because dance music did get a little after surviving in various stages of underground and slightly overground from you know 70s black gay disco to the warehouses of chicago and detroit and it's it's kind of always been survived because of that when electronic dance music was coined, particularly by the rest of the world, not so much England, the rest of the world, they took what was ours and what was something quite sacred and they they rinsed it for money and they bastardised it for money, not, not for fun, just to, to wring everything they could out of it. And it it portrayed we'd done in a close community it took it to a big larger community which is great but they kind of they they showed them the wrong bits and they said you know what you should do put on ridiculous clothing spend tons of money on vodka and and you know and have endless bass drops and and all the wrong things about it and at first i at first i was like oh it's really good that you know because some people are quite snooty and like yeah this edm it's not real music i'm like oh come on it's dj culture going overground the trickle down in in terms of business is good for all of us they can exist there we know what we do and you know there but then then i over the years i wore me down and i started to i started to resent the fact that they were possibly distorting the perception of what we did it's like, you know, the, the sort of thing. You know those jokes about, the, you know, the button-pushing DJs who don't do anything. At first it's like, hey, yeah, well, we know we do. And then after a while it's like, you honestly really do think we do that, don't you? You know, it's like, oh, right. And how do I look any different from, yeah. you know, that DJ who's, you know. And there was that one, have you seen that, but wait, when will the bass drop video? And I was thinking, on the one hand, that's kind of true. That's kind of our job is just to wind people up. And just to make it so that when we do, when you do hit the drop, somebody's head will explode. I would take that as a real compliment, you know. <laughs> well, sometimes I was like, can I make people come in their pants? Can I make their heads explode? Come on, come on. And on the one hand, is that, 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 that is all we do, and we do just press buttons. But on the other hand, if you kind of, you, you know, you're not necessarily satirising some of you actually might believe that that's really what yeah. is going on, and actually some of the DJs might believe that's what's going on. And then at that point, I just I, I got a bit annoyed with edm and i started willing it to implode on itself and but that's only that's not out of um not wanting all those those kids to have fun it's to preserve what i hold dear mm-hmm. uh and something a, a a scene and and a community that's been evolving and growing and over generations now uh and that we that needs kind of a little bit of um protection in the same way that you know champagne can only come from the champagne region perhaps house music as opposed to electronic dance music perhaps house music should only be allowed to come from those who will love it and nurture it yeah. and 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 who a proper family yeah. uh, and and there's a there, there's a little bit of me that um i've noticed that the techno family are very at the moment there's a kind of techno is always becoming a religion mm-hmm. and I was thinking I wonder if that's a direct reaction to EDM it's just like they want to distance themselves so much say we're a proper family you know yeah, yeah. and to other people our music might sound the same but it's not and our culture might sound the same it's not our fashions no you know and and I can see I've never I've never really been much of a purist 
but I, I'm beginning to become more purist about house music uh, just for its preservation because it's a beautiful thing should be here forever it's an absolutely perfect sentiment to end on I think cool thank you sorry my door no yeah sorry <laughs> house culture yes that actually did just happen I must admit I was absolutely bricking it to be meeting the legendary fat boy slim for that chat but as you heard he's a lovely fella who put us immediately at ease at his place and looked after us nicely with a great cuppa thanks very much Mr Cook as you did hear though the interview took place just as the first batch of coronavirus cancellations started coming through and whilst Fatboy Slim won't be appearing at Coachella, Glastonbury or the human traffic event at Printworks he mentioned this enforced lockdown might hopefully tempt him back into the studio maybe just maybe Speaking of tunes, you can find all of the tracks that you pick for our perfect playlist by getting onto Spotify and searching for House Culture Perfect Playlist. In there you'll also find the other chosen ones from all of our previous guests in Season 1. It's getting pretty big now, so stick it on shuffle and turn it up loud. Once you've done that, please support this podcast by loving, liking, tweeting, sharing, but most importantly, leaving a review. I can't tell you how important this is. So if you like what you hear and want to hear more, jot down some kind words for us, please. We can always give you a shout out in return. Which leads me to say a huge thanks to our honourable house culture godmother, Ali. Wow. The help you've given us, guys, is beyond words and what we owe you cannot be measured. Thank you so much. Here's to us doing loads more in the future. And if you've got this far into the podcast and still don't know what house culture is all about, we are a collective of house music fans who have come together through our mutual love of the beat to celebrate the spirit of house music. Hit up our Instagram feed at housecultureNet or follow the hashtag TrueHouseCulture to make sure you do not miss out on any of those parties currently popping off all over the world. And finally, you can reach out to me, Matt Rouse, directly on Instagram at DJ Matt Rouse. Thanks for listening. See you next time. House Culture.